Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, well, it's afternoon on day two and a half. Um, I hope we're going to be inspiring. Um, we have three um, speakers from the Met um, who are going to talk on um, quite different subjects, but one of the things we're going to try and uh, do in this session is just to relate um, the breadth now of thinking around this and the way in which it might apply. They have some, some other learning for students who are starting this year, which I think will be um, extremely useful. Well, look, we've got three speakers, which gives them about 16 or 17 minutes each. So I'm going to start off with um, Jane Corrigan, um, uh, Detective Superintendent Jane Corrigan, who's going to talk to you about um, prevent uh, and prevent referrals. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nothing nicer than the afternoon session straight after lunch. Hopefully, I won't bore you. Uh, just to set the tone, I will give you some homework at the end, um, so pens at the ready. Um, you heard from uh, a very powerful speaker yesterday, uh, Neil Basu, who was our boss up until uh, fairly recently in counterterrorism. And as he said, in my view, the government's most important pillar of contest is prevent, and we need to talk much more about it. Well, that's what I'm going to do today. So what is PREVENT? The PREVENT programme plays a significant role in reducing the threat by calling on the public and partners to work with us to identify those who are most vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. So they're not suspects, they're not victims. Some might argue they sit somewhere in the middle. We describe them as subjects. This affords us the opportunity to safeguard them in partnership and to manage the risk and harm posed to them, but also by them. You will be aware that the most recent UK attacks, both Fishmongers Hall and Reading, had links to prevent. One could say we're identifying the right people. This university was heavily impacted at the murder of two bright individuals, Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt, at Fishmongers Hall on the 29th of November 2019. At a time when our communities are facing the threat of COVID and the challenges of lockdown, our work is important as ever. And you heard Mr. Basu mention yesterday the threat we're facing in relation to hidden harm and that online area. For us to be successful in intervening early, it is vital that we work together to increase the confidence of people in our communities and organizations, to know what they are looking at and for, and arm them with the knowledge to report it whilst feeling safe to do so fully understanding what will happen when they do. And my question to you today is, do you know what to look for? Do your officers and colleagues know to look, what to look for? And do you know how to refer? The horrible truth is that we find after an atrocity, someone always knew it was going to happen. Some don't recognize it because they are criminals or conspirators. Believe it or not, we do get individuals who self-refer, but others because they just didn't know what to do or even whether it was worth doing. I would not want to live with the knowledge that I could have stopped it, the worst fear of every CT professional. By completing this work, it will enable CT policing to learn from the data it holds and to add an evidence base to decisions made. So my thesis is mapping terrorism risk in social and multidimensional space, tracking the concentrations of referrals and end outcomes within the PREVENT programme. So I had two questions to answer. Um, and in simple terms, this meant I looked at five years worth of data to understand if the subjects who are referred into the PREVENT programme, if their home address was relevant, and you could describe it something similar to looking at hotspot policing. I, I explored not only the addresses, but who referred the case. So did it matter who referred to us, you know, whether it was a school, whether it was CT policing, whether it was a friend or family member? Was ideology important? So, for example, did we see areas of uh, um, mapping across London where we looked at ideology? Was it higher in some areas? Did that match with demographics? Is that what we expected to see? And I looked at escalation, and some might call escalation being a failure of prevent, but we do have a percentage of cases that escalate. The second question was looking at a longitudinal study. So, for example, what did five years worth of prevent data tell us about tracking those concentrations of referrals? So what did repeat um, uh, uh, repeats into the programme because somebody can be referred in on more than one occasion? Does that mean an increase in risk? Does it mean they're deteriorating? Or actually, is that um, something that means that we're doing that intervention right? So how did I do this? Uh, well, I can tell you with great difficulty. 
Uh, we do not have a magic computer. Um, we didn't have uh, all the data that I needed in the format that I needed. But what I wanted to do was look at the frequency of referrals. So how many times did cases uh, come in to, to us? I wanted to look specifically at escalations because for me that's about understanding whether or not I can prevent not only terrorist offending but also I can encourage early referral. What about postcodes? Again, you know, the most recent census information that's going to come out is going to be really relevant for me because, again, you look at boroughs with high population, um, does that mean I'm going to get more referrals from those areas? Or actually, does more referrals mean a higher risk within those areas? I'll talk more about uh, that profile of the referrer and, and what that's told us uh, around this study. And again, that tracking of the repeat referrals. And then about the software that I used, I'll show you a slide at the end as to how we use that in our counterterrorism local profiles. So looking at the data, the first thing I had to do was understand and, and, and pick out, out of the 3,000 fields, um, what were relevant. So what was I going to use within my study? Because our data had changed over the years, I had to do a manual trawl to uh, fill in various sections from ideology to addresses. And I mentioned on my slide that only 12% of the postcodes were recorded. And that's because the, the database that we use, the Prevent Case Management Tracker, um, only came into existence in 2018. Before that, we had a combination of spreadsheets, Excel documents, uh, crime reporting. So therefore, we had to kind of merge all that data. And then I had to weigh up what was important. Do I invest time in filling in those blanks? I was really keen on making sure that there was no um, leakage in relation to this area in identifying individuals. And confidentiality is key. And for those of you who have worked in Prevent or know something about Prevent, it's often described as the toxic brand uh, within counterterrorism, and it has a lot of people who are very anti and very vocal about the brand of Prevent. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't identify any subjects, so some of the data I removed if it was linked to, you know, low levels of referrals in relation to a particular gender, or if it was a particular age, again, that was removed. And then I couldn't have done this really without the, the help of a, a great team and analysts to extract and translate um, the, the data into uh, various uh, software for mapping. Uh, what I have learned is skills around creating pivot tables and stack charts, uh, which I, I will take away from Cambridge, if nothing else. So what was the data that I looked at? So we had 6,190 referrals into the Prevent program over that five-year period. And that I took the years from January to December. So normally we work in financial years, but I felt it was really important to look at the whole year, particularly around COVID, because I think that will be really relevant for future studies. I talk about partner or non-agency referrals, so I had to group uh, each of the, uh, um, the referrers. We had about 65 different agencies and, and groupings, so I had to narrow that down and group it into agency and non-agency and look to see where those referrals came from. High-level ideologies, again, we had numerous fields de describing the different types of um, uh, ideology. Uh, so, for example, Daesh, um, ISIS, etc., had numerous combinations depending on what people believed. So I've grouped them into high-level ideologies. Location, I looked at two things. So I looked on a more granular level at postcode data, um, but I also looked at higher level at borough level data. And for those of you who know London, there are 32 boroughs, so I, I did a comparison across those boroughs. Age and gender, I thought, again, was significant because, you know, if you look at uh, the more recent attacks, and Mr. Basu again mentioned it yesterday, you know, the, the age of a, a convicted terrorist being 13, when actually usually the age is over 20. So was that, you know, relevant for me? Are we seeing a younger age being referred in to prevent? The number of times referred, so again, did that increase or decrease the risk, depending on how many times they came in? And was there any spikes? So, for example, we all know, uh, working in policing, that Friday is normally the call that you receive from, from social services um, concerned about a child. So was there any spikes in relation to referrals? I've talked to you about using the, the PCMT, which is the Prevent Case Management Tracker, um, which as a result of this study, we've actually looked to improve some of the fields that are used. 
the quality of the data wasn't what I wanted, but actually we were able to fill in a lot of the blanks, some with manual input, some with investing time, because we felt that the, impor the, the, the importance of the study it needed that investment. Um, postcode data is very um, controversial uh, amongst um, uh, practitioners within PREVENT because, again, you don't want to highlight a particular area as being linked to uh, a threat. And then what does outcomes tell me? So, for example, I will talk more about how we manage cases in London and how we fit in um, nationally around that. So, I've got two slides here, uh, which you probably can't see, which is not a bad thing, because I actually don't want to call out any local authority, because I don't think it's fair in this environment, but I will be discussing referrals with those local authorities, um, where I've identified um, hidden harm and risk. But looking at those over the five-year period, we can say that 6% of cases escalate. Now, again, we talked about, well, is that, is that good? Is that bad? Is that a failure? Uh, or does it mean that we're identifying the right people? And when I talk about escalate, I'm talking about escalating into the pursue space. And I mentioned at the beginning uh, that the link between terrorism and prevent is quite significant. Certainly for me, every time there is a, a CT attack, my first question is, were they on prevent? So on the, on the far left, on the bottom slide, you can see uh, one borough that kind of peaks above the rest. Well, what is it? Why, why is that borough peaking? Does that mean that they've got a higher threat area? Does it mean that they've got better processes in place? And um, what is producing those referrals? And then you look in the middle of the table, and what I can tell you is that the, the uh, borough that ranked 14 out of 32 in terms of referrals actually had 18% of cases escalate. That's significant when you look at only 6% overall across London. So what is it about that area? Does that mean there is a tolerance issue? And that's what I think it is. I think in London, certainly in some of the inner boroughs, we've got this acceptance of harm and a real delay in relation to reporting because they accept that things will be at a higher level. I think that's really important for PREVENT because PREVENT is about really identifying people almost before they get on that radicalisation journey, whereas in London, my argument would be they're already too far down that radicalisation journey, which is then leading to escalation. So what did age tell me? So we talked about uh, terrorists getting uh, younger. Um, and certainly within PREVENT, the, the mode age is 15, and that might shock you. And actually, when you look at who refer cases, you'll see that we get a high proportion of referrals from schools. Not so much in London, which again um, is a, a tolerance level for us. But when you look at the, the trend line over the five-year period, what can be seen is that actually people are getting older. So for example, the people that you know, would have been 15 uh, five years ago um, and now 20, um, they're the ones uh, that are getting referring. This indicates a shift in age. So again, what is the new census uh, information going to tell me? Does this link within, with the terrorism offending? And how, how can I use that to better predict what's going to escalate? Or more importantly, where do I need to focus officers' resources around reaching out to communities to get those referrals in relation to those individuals. So in turning to ideology, Islamist threat is still the biggest threat, but I thought it was important to highlight this shift that we've seen in relation to extreme right-wing terrorism. So over the last two years, when I looked at the five years' worth of data, 50% of those referrals came in the last two years. And the age grouping uh, followed the trend, but actually there was this other age that was standing out, which is the over 40s. Now, what does that mean for us? Uh, that might mean that you've got a parent-child radicalization issue. That might mean that you've got kind of disgruntled communities. How do we identify where uh, the areas are around extreme right wing because the majority of this is happening online. So again, this might uh, tell me what I need to do around reaching those communities. Who's going to refer the 40-year-old? 
because more often than not they live on their own or they uh, are, are, are married. You, they're not being seen by schools. They're not being seen by family members. Uh, so who's actually going to refer them in? So that, again, is, is really interesting for me. How do I reach that cohort of people to prevent terrorism? I talked earlier about um, management. So in London, uh, we manage a, a much higher percentage of cases in comparison to the national management. So that means people are already far down that radicalization journey. So I want to uh, invest time in working with four local authorities where we can understand, so for example, the local authority that had the highest number of referrals, the local authority that had uh, the uh, middle of the range referrals but the highest escalation rate, down to the borough that had the least number of referrals. I want to work with four London boroughs to understand management of cases, to cost those cases, and that will allow us to then invest time in the right places. Referrers really important. So what this study showed, looking at the chart on the top left, the top 10 referrers account for 82% of all the referrals over the five years. CT policing schools being the top two, no surprise. On the lower scale, you can see prisons, communities and families. The highest percentage of escalation uh, per cases referred uh, was prisons. So 13% of prison referrals escalated. 12% of community referrals escalated and families 7%. So that tells me the people who are living with or know those individuals closest are leaving it too late before they refer to us. So that's something that we need to change. Currently just 2% of referrals into the Prevent programme are made by family and friends despite the fact that they are more likely to spot the signs. Nationally, 58% of all prevent referrals um, were young people under the age of uh, 15. So again, we really need to encourage families to, to act early. I'll just show you this slide to show how we use the study um, and how I use the mapping data in the recent CT profile. So this isn't... Um, uh, something that we've just done as part of a, a thesis and it gets forgotten about. We've actually used the data that we've, we've invested in um, over the uh, last two years uh, and put it to good use. So what are the policy implications, just in summary? So on an operational level, it allows me to assess where I'm going to place uh, people, where I'm going to place resources, what boroughs are flagging as high risk areas based on escalation, what boroughs are doing really well. The mapping, as I said in that slide that I showed you, was utilised in the counter-terrorism profile. I've already spoken to MOPAC, so the uh, Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime Commissioner, around how we commission community groups to invest in areas where we believe there's hidden harm to increase referrals. And Homeland Security are already working with me on trying to cost the prevent case management. So what is it that I want you to do? Well, really, what I want you to do is ask yourself... Um, what do you do in your force? What more could you do in your force? And do you understand what your picture looks like? And it takes me back to my original statement. The horrible truth is that we find after an atrocity, somebody always knew it was going to happen. By completing this work, it enables CT policing to learn from the data it holds to add an evidence base to decisions made. And my message to you today is to act early. Thank you very much. Whilst we hand over, I'll just um, introduce our next speaker. Um, Phil Davies is a DCI. Uh, Phil has been working on a, a very large-scale project in London, which is a replication of one that happened a few years ago called Turning Point. I don't know, but perhaps a few people have heard about it. It's a, it's a fantastic program, uh, and this presentation is around victim satisfaction related to Turning Point. Phil, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Phil Davies um, from the Met, and... Um, my thesis title was Victim Satisfaction with Police Diversion from Prosecution and Cautions, uh, a Randomised Control Trial. So, first of all, I'm going to provide some background um, to, to the trial. Um, some of you uh, will know all, uh, all about Turning Point, others won't. So, back in, well, 10 years ago now, West Mids, um, they ran a, uh, the first Turning Point Randomised Control Trial, um, it ran for three years. There were some positive results around reoffending rates, victim satisfaction, and also uh, reduced costs to the criminal justice system. 
And what this is, in, in effect, is low-harm offenders um, randomised into two groups. One uh, went down the ordinary pathway, the other was subject to a short contract. If they succeeded in the, this tailored, short, light-touch contract, then at the end there'd be no further action taken against them. So that's, in effect, what, what we've replicated in London. Um, uh, 2017, uh, Lamy Review. Turning points, the West Mid's turning point was seen as a, as a partial solution to tackling racial disproportionality in the criminal justice system. Um, and I won't go into it, it's easy to get into the, into the detail, I'm sure you'll, you'll learn about, all about this in due course, but MOJ, uh, their chance to change project, uh, focusing on um, offender dis dis desistance policing, um, picked up on this and they ran three pilots, set up three pilot sites across the country to replicate um, to, to see whether the, the findings were similar to make those big policy decisions. So um, London, North West BCU uh, was one of them, West Yorkshire, the other, and Surrey uh, began, but um, they stopped due to resourcing issues. So alongside my key research question, which I've already uh, outlined, I had a series of sub-questions. Um, they centred mainly on prior research, uh, the implementation history, um, methodology, stats, uh, and then results and conclusions. And for those who aren't familiar with London, that's uh, that map there, the um, BCUs across London, northwest, sitting there with made up of um, Barnet, Brent, and Harrow. Uh, phase one, which I'll go into in more detail, was Barnet. That's where we started off, uh, and then we went into Brent and Harrow once we, we, we once we were happy. Um, and so it's, it's, it is running now um, across those three boroughs. So on, in terms of prior research, it, it was a pretty bleak landscape. Um, very little um, material in terms of victim satisfaction around out-of-court disposals. Um, quite a bit on restorative justice um, and out-of-court disposals, but not the um, victim satisfaction piece. Now, I, I cite at the bottom there, Ames et al. 2018. They conducted a, uh, an experiment, an out-of-court disposal experiment, with 13,500 offenders. Now, I, I don't mention them to deride them, but they only surveyed six people, which is a massive missed opportunity. And I flag this up because if you are going to include a victim survey or do a victim survey or include that as part of an RCT, then you've got to really, right from the outset, commit to putting the resource and thinking into it because um, I think we can all agree that uh, you know, had they actually really invested some time and effort into victims, um, then there could have been some very useful findings. So just a quick uh, point on that. So key findings. Um, I have to make it very really clear that this is a, an interim victim satisfaction study and it's a partial replication. Or a bit, it's not an exact replication of Westmids, but the, the key the key building blocks are the same. Um, it's early days, um, and we can't draw too much out of it. But what, what, we, what we do know is that running a, a randomised control trial in a very busy uh, London BCU is possible. Uh, and that's also, we've got through a, a merge of those, of those boroughs that we, I showed you, plus also a period of, of COVID. So if it can survive that, and, you know, then, then, then uh, don't be uh, afraid of getting stuck into an RCT. It's not a walk in the park, but um, you know, I think uh, there's, there's some real um, challenges and learning if, if you do go down that path. We've got 82.8% of the treatment group are currently reporting case satisfaction against an 80% of the control group, which is good. And we do enjoy, anyway, really good um, victim satisfaction across those three boroughs. We, um, amongst the 15 questions that... Um, we used as our survey instrument. There were some free text opportunities as well. Effective communication came out as the key, one of the key drivers for victim satisfaction. Um, another key finding is that a dedicated team can deliver victim support alongside their offender management duties. And I'll go into the structure of the team a bit later. Um, and of course, lastly, this is further evidence that um, out-of-court disposals, disposals are a viable option to the normal response to low-harm offences. This is, I think, the only um, stat bit I've got for you. But what this shows, 
Um, out of all the, those different questions that um, the victims were asked on the control and the, on the contract group, um, this is the, the difference in positive outcomes. So, for example, if we look at the extremes, 25% um, more victims from the, uh, the turning point group felt that they, they, were, being, uh, they were kept informed of, of their case by police. Um, and if we look at the bottom, 22% more of the control group, the ordinary pathway, uh, felt that they have um, trust in the criminal justice system. So if we kind of, there's bits in the middle there which aren't too different, but if we do look at um, the, the sort of the outliers, perhaps um, quite a bit to do with where, where Turning Point um, does a better job at this stage um, is around, you know, that contact and, um, and their, their views on how effective the criminal justice system is as a whole. At the bottom, you know, it's, it's still very, it strikes me as being quite a fresh, you know, people maybe aren't entirely happy of, of, of that non-traditional pathway being used. But nevertheless, ultimately, the satisfaction levels are slightly higher here, a negligible amount, but we're no worse off through the turning point um, pathway than we are with the ordinary pathway. So looking at the data collected, um, we collected uh, social demographic data of all the victims, gender, age, ethnicity, their home borough, um, whether they were personal or business victim, um, the nature of the offence in broad strokes. Of course, this is all low-level offending or low-harm offending. Uh, the period of time between randomisation and the survey taking place. And for, for those who are going to enter into designing their own uh, stu studies, experiments, um, it was advice to me to, to really get into the, the detail around certain things. So, for example, when we phoned up a victim to, make a, to, to conduct a survey, we, we made a log of how many times it took to get through, and when we got through, how many rings it took before the, um, the victim picked up the phone. And why? Well, we were working to some rules, and I set a rule that it should be no less than 10 calls and no more than 16, because... 10 doesn't give you enough time to get the phone, arguably, for some people. 16 plus, if they pick up the phone, then, you, you know, you're going to maybe feel a bit harassed. And that, that can affect the way that um, the, the survey responses come in. And it, it's having those rules in place and each part of the team knowing exactly what they are that allows the, you know, the consistency, the, the validity of the experiment to, um, to take place, you know, just trying to reduce all those differences because... Uh, there was no way I could have phoned all these victims on my own. I didn't, so I had to form a small team and I, I dip sampled them so that everyone was in tune with one another. So it's the RCT timeline at uh, Northwest. I don't know if Katie's here. Katie Harbour? Yeah, so back in 2017, um, Katie initiated the project and um, her thesis last year was on the implementation. I say it's no, it's no walk in the park at all and Northwest BCU is a, one of the best BCUs in London, I, I would say that, but it is, with lots of can-do officers, but even, to, even that, with that backdrop, it was, it was pretty hard to land. There's an awful lot of learning in Katie's thesis, so I'd recommend you read that. It's on Moodle, or in, uh, I think it's in the library as well, isn't it, uh, Katie? So there's, there's a huge amount of learning in there to, to, to pick up on, whatever, whether it's, whether it's a RCT around turning point or, or something else. Anyway, we, we, our first eligible offender was randomised within Barnet, phase one, uh, July 2018. Um, we were able to get some funding, about 450 grand from MOPAC. That led to a permanent team, which is currently led by Ashley Kilgallen, who's a fantastic uh, project manager, really committed, um, academic, with lots of policing knowledge. So she gets on really well and gets things sorted. Um, we then, in January 2020, moved out to the, to the other two uh, boroughs. Um, and for my thesis, the cut-off date was uh, the October last year. And the rule around surveys would take place six months after randomization because we needed to allow enough time for the contract groups, uh, the offenders, um, to have either succeeded with their contract or failed. And in, either way, six months um, was, the, was the time period. So. That's when we started. Spring 21, 400th offender was randomised, which is cool. 
Um, we've got a target of 525, I believe, is, is what we're currently looking for, and we're on track to do that. So we, that's December 2021. That's when we're going to finish. At, the intention is to finish the offender randomizations. We will run on then managing those offenders until the summer of 2022. Um, it'll be the end of next year that the, all of the surveys should have been finished. And then we track offender reoffending for two years after. So it won't be until summer 24 that we have a, a final product. So methodology, this is so it's a survey instrument, 15 questions with some free tech questions. These, we, we had a slight um, issue in that we were commissioned by the Minister of Justice and they were owning the uh, survey, ultimately the survey design. We had an influence on it and they looked at some of the questions and learning from West Midlands turning point, but ultimately it, it was their call. So we had to wait for that and there was a slight delay um, in getting that sorted. So some of the, some of the victims, they, they'd been, uh, their cases were you know, maybe a year and a half at the most old before we conducted that survey. But that was the same, it balanced out because it was the same of course for the both groups, control and contract. Uh, we put the survey scripts through victim commissioner's office around the language. Um, there was a, a bit of debate but also around the Leichhardt scale. So in terms of satisfaction, are you very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied or very dissatisfied? You know, there's, there's four there. There's lot, as you'll find out, there's lots of arguments either way. Do, we, do you have a fifth and then people sit on the fence? You know, do you have more um, options? It's, it's, there's all sorts of um, options around that. But ultimately, our hands were tied um, by, way of the, by way of MOJ owning that. So we, we kept a very careful record um, as to the surveys we were doing and all that detail that I spoke about earlier, which helps kind of... Um, ensure that not only is there consistency in our approach, but also when you come to analyse, you can really get into the, into the weeds around looking for things that stand out and make a difference. Um, so, yeah, calibrating colleagues, um, we, 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 had to have, we had to make sure everybody was taking the same approach when speaking to victims. We used a victim script, um, some guidelines, and I said oh, we all came together and I would just make sure everybody was doing the same, had having the same approach with their victims to try and reduce that, the difference in, in approach. Um, so, moving on. So, it's very, so I had, we've achieved so far at this point was a 75% response rate, which is, which is good, but this is only from 104 um, um, victims. 50 in the turning point, the, the treatment group, and 54 in the control group. But nevertheless, this, this is implemented now and it's, it's building on a, on a regular basis. The, um, yes, of course, we, we benefited, no doubt, from COVID with people being indoors, especially the telephone approach. Um, and that's one of the challenges going forward is to make sure we really keep making every effort to get hold of victims to make sure that response rate is, is as high as possible. We wanted to be over 70%. We are at the moment. Um, some of the early, in the early days when, when the evidential reviewing officers who, who conducted the randomizations, there were some errors there which meant we lost some, some, some of the cases, but um, it's, it's building on a, on a regular basis, which is, which is very positive. So, um, big, big sort of caution needed. Um, we, know, we know from last uh, Sunday's football match that not everything that happens in Northwest BCU goes as we want it to. And uh, whilst we, fingers are crossed, that our initial findings continue to be positive, it, that um, it, they could flip any, any, any stage at all. So, but it has, the big standout is that we, is we have been able to land an RCT with, within Northwest BCU, um, sample size far too small, but ultimately we're moving towards some, you know, some national policy decisions in, in this space, and we, we know that um, there's an MPCC policy around our, our court disposals, which we would support, the Police Crime and Sentencing Courts Bill, uh, um, out of disposals mentioned there, so emerging legislation, you've got the Lamy Review, um, the whole Black Lives Matter piece, and the scalability. We, we know that how many officers or, or members of staff it takes to manage uh, low harm offences within a BCU. So we've got, we have got an idea of what sort, if we were to scale it up and go across the whole of London, what that would look like and how much it would cost. Um, and of course, we are enriching a, that bleak landscape, which I mentioned earlier, with, with, some, with, with some interesting findings. 
Um, the third um, and final of our presentations is um, uh, Ben Clark. Um, uh, and Ben is going to look at victim satisfaction, but from a, a slightly different angle. Um, ben has been analyzing volume crime um, and the way in which we address victim satisfaction, particularly callback in that environment. Uh, so Ben's presentation is based around that. Uh, ready when you are, Ben. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ben Clark. Uh, until or, or during the, the time of this study, I was a superintendent on frontline policing in the Met Police on uh, Camden and Islington boroughs. Uh, so Central North BCU, actually the best BCU, uh, leave North West to one side. So that was it. Um, what I wanted to do, and, and it, it segued neatly in from, from what Phil was talking, sort of the bigger picture, I, I wanted to bring it right back down to local policing. Uh, and it, this is kind of based on, on personal experience. Uh, in that when I lived in London, uh, I was a victim of a burglary uh, and I knew what was going to happen. I knew the soccer was going to turn up, I knew the police officer would turn up, take the report, and I knew that a few days later I would get a letter saying, uh, thanks very much, but there's no leads. If you, let, if you need any more information, give us a call. What I wasn't expecting was the neighbourhood's officer turning up a week later with some crime prevention materials and crime prevention advice uh, and, and some reassurance. Now, even as a police officer, I thought, well, that's good. Uh, and certainly my family members were really impressed with that. And, and I took that forward and I thought, well, actually, can we replicate that? Can we, can we see whether it does make a difference or whether it's just me being sentimental uh, or whether it's me being, um, maybe, maybe sort of need to manage my expectations a little bit. So um, I looked around uh, and I looked at the, the sort of literature around this. Uh, and in, in the policing world and in the criminological world, there isn't a great deal. Um, it all covers bigger things, such as violence and, and satisfaction around uh, victims of domestic abuse, around uh, sexual offences and so on. So I had to look a little bit wider. Uh, and actually looking at uh, studies that took place in the field of medicine uh, and the NHS, there were some real startling findings that follow-up contact, even over just on a telephone call, made a hell of a difference to patient satisfaction. And I thought... Actually, can, can that be replicated uh, in the policing world? So uh, I decided to do a bit of a study and see whether just a phone call uh, to those victims of crime who have reported what we would term as low-level or, or volume crime actually made a difference to their satisfaction. Um, obviously, with, with a lot of these crimes, you know, we, we simply haven't got the resources to, uh, to, to go and do a personal visit, however much we would like to, however much we would want to. But actually, does a five-minute phone call make that difference? Uh, and obviously, this lended itself very much to, to testing through the means of, of a randomised control trial. So I took um, uh, a 10-week period, and luck was very much on my side for, for two reasons. Number one, that 10-week period helpfully took place between the end of lockdown one and the beginning of lockdown two, otherwise I'd have had a bit of a problem. Uh, but when crime levels were back to what we would have normally expected them to be, uh, the second piece of luck, and for those of you wanting to do uh, studies and experiments, find a really good inspector, sergeant, chief inspector who can drive it for you, uh, because they did the majority of the work. I, I just sat there and, and looked at the spreadsheets at the end of it. And the third piece of luck was because of uh, the COVID pandemic, I had a pool of officers who were sat at home, they were clinically vulnerable, uh, or they were not engaged in their normal duties, which meant that they could provide some of those follow-up contacts uh, a bit easier than might have been the case. So I took a 10-week uh, uh, study, and I did what's called a, a block a randomized control trial. And I took two crime types. I took theft of pedal cycle, and I took theft from motor vehicles. Both crime types, fairly volume, uh, and fair, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say the vast majority of them do get screened out from further investigation. Um, and in essence, a block randomised control trial was two experiments. So we had block A, vehicle crime, and block B, cycle theft, using exactly the same methodology, but we teased them out to, to, make, to see whether there were the differences in, in the case. So just going through the, the, the uh, stats here, we had, in this 10-week period, 954 uh, vehicle crimes on Central North and 740 cycle thefts on Central North. I excluded crimes that had been screened in 
because, let's face it, an officer was going to contact them anyway. I excluded crimes that had been flagged uh, in relation to domestic abuse, hate crime, or, or other such crimes where the victim would have received some follow-up contact because we didn't want that as a confounding variable uh, in relation to what was taking place. I then randomised, <coughs> pardon me, um, the crimes that were, that were recorded, uh, and we wound up with, broadly speaking, a 50-50 split between the treatment and the control groups in each block. Uh, so the control group simply got the standard service. They didn't get a reduced service. I think we need to be clear on this. They got the standard MET service uh, that was provided to all victims of crime that had been screened out. But the treatment group had the same service with the addition of a phone call from a local officer based on Central North uh, BCU uh, who provided a bit of an update it has been screened out, but that doesn't mean to say that nothing is happening. They would explain that it fed into intelligence reports. They explained it would feed into patrol patterns, briefings, and would provide crime prevention advice depending on what was in the crime report. Uh, they would also ask the victim if there, were, there was anything else they could assist with. Uh, after that, we then conducted um, a survey on both the treatment and control groups. And the officers conducting the survey were different uh, I mentioned the clinically vulnerable. It was the clinically vulnerable officers who were sitting at home. They conducted the surveys so that I could say that it wasn't us marking our own homework in respect of what had gone on. The survey was the standard MOPAC victim satisfaction survey. We took the questions from that, which avoided some of the issues that Phil was alluding to because I already had like at scale, already had agreed wording, I already had agreed scripts and things like that. And actually it was able then that I could take that back to MOPAC and other officers or senior officers within the MPS and say, look, this is comparing apples and apples in terms of satisfaction bits. Uh, I was impressed to hear that 70% uh, response rate in terms of, of the surveys he did. Uh, as you can see, mine are probably more around about the 40 to 50%, which even for telephone surveys is good. Uh, just a top tip for anybody thinking of doing surveys, don't forget police officers will call from a withheld number, and even though you provide them with the means to unmask the number, they may not do it because it involves pressing more buttons. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> we would have probably done better if, <laughs> if I'd just given them a load of mobile phones in the first place. So survey response rate, sorry, pardon me, survey response rate in the region of 35 to 40%. But that was enough for me to uh, draw some conclusions from it. So having asked the survey questions, uh, as I said, mentioned on the MOPAT public voice dashboard, uh, it covered sort of areas of their perceptions of treatment uh, and how satisfied uh, they were, and also their opinion of the police service prior to and following the, the, the crime that they'd reported. Uh, I analysed them descriptively, so we looked at uh, demographics, so we, we made sure we included things like age, gender, self-defined ethnicity, and whether they'd been repeat victims within, or reported that they were repeat victims in the previous 12 months. Uh, I did uh, tests for statistical significance, uh, two-tailed t-tests, and uh, for effect size uh, around Cohen's D. And just to be clear on this, there was an intention to treat analysis, so we did the results on the treatment and control group whether they had received the phone call or not. Because to be clear on this one, this is the real world we're talking about if we're gonna put this in place. If somebody doesn't receive the follow-up phone call, they still might affect the satisfaction results anyway. So you've got to bear that in mind. There is no such thing as a perfect world where 100% of people will, phone up, uh, will pick up the follow-up call. So this is, we, we did this for intention to treatment because we wanted the realistic result. And here are the results, which were surprising. So we have the nine questions that we looked at Vehicle crime, uh, you can see there was little, if any, difference. And in fact, in some cases, a negative effect, although just do note the margin of error, the 90% the, um, confidence interval that goes across that, crossing the 0% line. But it was clear that for victims of vehicle crime, the intervention did not have an effect. However, for victims of cycle theft, you can see a clear and positive difference, and in some cases, up to a 15% change in their satisfaction levels for, a, uh, for the better, uh, which raised some interesting questions that went into it. Um, and I also then looked at subgroup analysis that, that went back into it. So those are the overall results. And the subgroup analysis, which I'm gonna caveat now, heavily caveat it, because when we broke them down into small subgroups and deliberately you can't see the numbers of things that are going on there, but just gives you an idea of how many stats tests I had to run. So I'm, I'm going for sympathy here rather than anything else. Um, very small subgroup sizes in some cases, particularly when we looked at age groups and, uh, and bits and pieces like that, which means that I would 
exercise caution on some of the effects, but we did see what appeared to be concentration of effects and some interesting concentration of effects. We found that younger victims of cycle theft were much more impressed with the follow-up phone call than older victims of cycle theft. We found that victims who self-defined as non-white, there was more of a positive effect with them. We found that younger victims of vehicle crime were the most dissatisfied with the follow-up call. And older victims, does anybody who is slightly of my age or above ride a bike, you can clear, clearly see from my physique that I don't, but certain people view their bikes as their pride and joy when they're older. Uh, and actually, they were the least satisfied with the follow-up call that came, came on from that. So it, it, it does mean that they're actually, the, the so what question that followed up from it is, um, there, there is some interesting conclusions that we can draw. I think my view is that we can have a quick win here. There is an opportunity in certain crime types to improve victim satisfaction and improve it quite significantly through what is ultimately quite a low cost in terms of time and money process. I think I worked out that a officer doing a phone call to a victim worked out at just under £10 a call. Um, obviously, officer time notwithstanding in relation to that. There is a chance to close our satisfaction gaps, particularly amongst younger victims and amongst those victims who define as, uh, themselves as being non-white. Uh, historical satisfaction gaps here, potentially there is an opportunity here. And I suppose the key takeaway from me, and, and this is more supposition than anything else, uh, why was there this difference? Why was there this difference between vehicle crime victims and cycle theft victims? Well, there are some studies that looked at this, and, and, it, and we could suppose, but it needs further research, of, of which I will talk about in a second, uh, we can suppose that actually, does it depend on differing expectation levels of those victims? We know that there are certain police forces have gone public and said they will not support uh, investigations into cycle theft unless there's some clear solvability factors that go into place. There was a study of cycle uh, owners in London a couple of years ago, and over half of them confidently expected their bike to get nicked. Um, with those sort of things that are coming out, is it any surprise that a follow-up phone call to the police saying, look, we're really sorry about this, is actually an unexpected bonus, which those victims were not expecting to have. Conversely, we have a previous mayor of London, who, who may or may not be the current prime minister, uh, and a previous uh, Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, who may or may not be the current policing minister, who have previously gone on the record and said that vehicle crime should be a priority for forces. Vehicle crime victims need to be focused on. And if, if you think about the cost of running a car insurance, particularly for younger victims, cost of running a car, the inconvenience and, and the victim perceived solvability factors, if it, then all you get is a follow-up phone call from an officer saying, there, there, I'm terribly sorry your car got broken into. Potentially, your expectations haven't been met, and that may, may explain the difference in those, in those satisfaction levels. Which leads me on to the last line here, uh, and it is, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain here that this is the exact presentation that I used to the Met's Victims Board, and bringing it back to actually the topic of what we're talking about today, research in the Met, this is how we can bring research from this environment back into the operational policing context because I, rep uh, I went to the victims board, gave these studies, and as a result, the Met is now conducting larger scale RCTs to understand the nuances around victim satisfaction, to understand whether we can replicate this going forward and to see where the Met itself can focus its attention in terms of victim satisfaction, which is one of the key priorities going forward to 2025. So that is where we are. Um, I absolutely would echo uh, what Phil and Jane have said in the support that the Met have given through its research and evidence-based policing group, through Paul's team, uh, through Mr Barnes uh, and others who have helped this to happen. And, and the great thing about this is this is something that borough commanders and borough officers can take away as something that they could actually do themselves on a borough and it's evidence-based. So I would recommend that it's certainly you can have a think about it on your forces and I'm perfectly happy to answer any questions or take anything away from you this afternoon but thank you. Okay has, does anybody have a question for any of our speakers? Yeah thank you and um, just a question for Philip. Philip you um very interesting to listen to your out of court disposal work in uh, in Kent with sort of trying to evolve ours so no doubt I need to take contact details but just in relation to the resource requirement um, you sort of mentioned around the structure of the team 
that helped you sort of embed it and, and move it forward. What, can you describe kind of what the structure of that team looked and felt like that, that got the job done and maybe continues to get the job done? Yeah, by all means. So once the permanent team turned up, uh, that's run by Ashley as the project manager, and she has a, a deputy um, who is also the victim lead. Um, there are then two offender managers, and we also have um, Peter Nehru's daughter, Ellen, to help on the stats, but she's one or two days a week. So it's sort of, let's say, four and a quarter. Uh, Excuse me, that's almost Dr. Eleanor Nehru to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. So yes, that's, that's how, and prior to that, KT had a, um, uh, you know, there were about, was it six or seven on top of their day job, KT, before we got that permanent team? Moral of the story is if you want to run a complex RCT in, in busy environments, it's very possible, but you must have an on-the-ground project team that can run it for you and track it. The, the, one, the one thing I would add is in terms of those people that conduct the victim surveys, we, we do still have people that do that on top of their business as usual, um, you know, probably three or four officers who, who are the right officers, and um, so there's that, there's that consistency. There's probably eight of us in total that do them calibrated. Um, in terms of the calls that the, your team made to the victims, how much did you script those calls to take away any variance in the message that was being delivered and the questions that were therefore being asked of the victims? So um, for the, the follow-up calls, there wasn't a script per se. There was a checklist that the officers had to work through. Um, that was one of the things we, we sat down and, and looked at as a project team. And again, um, this was part of the sort of feedback process between those putting the calls in and myself because originally I did look at a script um, but, but the clear feedback was they wanted to look at the crime reports to identify something where they could have a hook talking into the victim and relate to the victim. Uh, I was quite happy as long as they covered the main points that we wanted to cover, i.e. that the officers were local, that the crime had been reviewed by in essence a human being uh, and, and what was going to happen with it, I, I was quite happy for them to do that. Um, there, there is a danger in doing a script for that that the call comes across sounding as wooden, uh, and particularly there are some who will, will go off piste no matter what. So I'd rather they covered the main points on, on the checklist rather than anything else. But for the surveys, absolutely it was a script. It, it was a script down to the last full stop. I, let me now introduce uh, former Chief Constable Crispian Strachan of the um, Northumbria Police, who is going to chair a panel on a uh, group of uh, victims or subjects who are potentially, if you look at the death rate, uh, in one of the, the highest uh, near uh, lethality groups uh, that police have any contact with, which uh, may account for the enormous amount of time invested uh, in dealing with these cases, uh, uh, known in policing as MISPERS. Uh, for people who are not in policing, we're talking about missing persons reports, and we have had a whole series of studies of uh, the risk factors that relate to death, that relate to serious injury or criminal victimization um, or suicide or other outcomes that are um, possible but fortunately very rare and therefore um, uh, highly uh, appropriate for those prediction efforts that try to identify rare uh, events. Um, but in a way that people can understand, because random forests, A, are hard to do, B, are hard to implement, um, C, what to do until the random forest builder model, uh, sorry, random forest model builder comes, is to do conditional probabilities, odds, ratios, and the kinds of things that I'm going to ask uh, Chris and Strachan now to introduce. Chris. Uh, we have two speakers this afternoon, Superintendent Ryan Doyle, Head of Criminal Justice and Custody from Devon and Cornwall, but as you'll gather, missing persons are not generally what happens in custody, so I think this is no, more Cambridge. most of them are in custody. <laughs> not too many. This is generally what happens in, in terms of Cambridge research. And Chief Inspector Marcus Cater from Hampshire, who was a student of mine some time ago, but despite that seems to have been doing some very good research. I'll hand you over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, as I said, uh, my name's Ryan Doyle from uh, Devon Cornwall Police, uh, and this is around targeting those missing people most likely to come to harm. Um, just a little bit of context first. Um, personally, I think, nationally, the biggest threat to the police service is legitimacy. So that's, we've talked about trust and confidence already, but also trust and confidence from the public that we, have, we are using our resources effectively, 
and our ability to keep people safe or safer, as a colleague said earlier. For Devon and Cornwall, on a daily basis, missing people can account for up to 15% of our demand. So that's both in terms of our high volume of children's homes that we have in the area, um, our ageing population, so a lot of elderly people, but also people who come to Devon and Cornwall who are missing from other, from other areas of the country as well. Um, and we've heard this said a few times today from, on a personal level, I wanted my research to count, to make a difference, and I wanted it to add value to the service. So the methodology, it was a retrospective analysis of over 92,000 MISPAs recorded on Compact. So that's the uh, missing person database that we currently use in the force. We moved to niche next year, but we've been on Compact since 2008. Um, we were looking at predictive associations between as Byron predictors gain from the risk factors known at the time of report, i.e., are they missing from care, have they missing from home, are they dyslexic, disabled, etc., etc., and then those harmful outcomes. Um, and those are harmful outcomes that recorded on compact as any harm, so that can be um, fatality, serious injury, emotional harm, any other harm, so any harmful outcome. Um, and uh, all, all those were ag aggregated into, into those harmful outcomes. Um, the sample, we did the, the whole cohort as a start, but then we subdivided it into um, male and female categories for three age, uh, three age groups. So that was uh, juveniles, so under 18s, adults aged 18 to 64, and then uh, 65 and over to see if there were any differences between those. And I'll go into some detail around why, what prompted that um, shortly. So um, in terms of findings, uh, of all the MISPAs in the study, one thing just to, to mention, sorry, just in terms of the data, so there's actually around 94,000 MISPAs recorded um, in Devon and Cornwall in that time. Um, there was a, a very small number, um, just under 2,000, that were taken out of the study. Um, number of reasons in terms of that data cleansing, um, some not recorded as um, having uh, a, a found report on there, um, some of the detail missing around um, age, so, you know, very small numbers. The, the main um, chunk of that, um, just under 2,000 that was removed, was around gender. Um, and, and this was purely, um, this group were removed, or these individuals were removed, purely because their gender wasn't shown as a binary male or female on that system, and we needed it to be for the purposes of this study. Now, there's a whole wider debate and thought process around the binary or non-binary nature of gender, and that is not part of this study, and it's really important we reflect that because there are people refer to, recorded in compacts as trans, but they're not routinely and consistently recorded in the right way. So some people are recorded as male and then have trans as a, um, as a risk factor. Some people are recorded as trans male or trans female, and it, it doesn't provide that consistency or the ability for us to perform a study such as this with odds ratios. Okay, so it's just really important that that's, um, we're clear around that around gender for the purposes of this study. So 54% of those in the study related to those recorded as male, 46 recorded as female. The biggest chunk were juveniles, 59% juveniles. Um, of all of the uh, MISPAs in the study, 3.8% um, came to harm of any type. So when we talk about um, MISPAs that end in, missing person records that end in a fatality, that's a really low number. That's 1% or, or less. Um, so all harm is 3.8%. Despite being the biggest group, juveniles, only 1.7% of juveniles come to harm whereas 6.8% of adults and over 65s came to harm. And then in terms of the, um, the gender split for each group, um, juvenile females come to harm more often than juvenile males. Adult females come to harm more than adult males. But for the over 65 category, it flips, and it's adult males. It's the males that come to harm more often. Um, regarding those that came to harm, well, half of it's missing on here. I don't know why. Um, to show, but the 3% um, of all low risk missing persons came to harm, 5% of medium risk, 14% of high risk. And it's medium risk that really drew my attention and kind of caused the, um, the, the most kind of focus for me. 
84% of juveniles that came to harm had originally been recorded as medium risk. Um, and that was replicated um, for uh, adults and, and overs as well, in the sense that that um, large percentage of them that came to harm had originally been recorded as medium risk. Jeff talked earlier around um, with Dash, um, when we talk about serious harm, and you kind of, what, you know, what do you think serious harm is? What do you think serious harm is? What do you think serious harm is? Um, the, the definition in APP for um, medium risk in terms of coming to harm is that um, they are likely to come to harm, but not serious harm. So you have to not only decide for yourself what um, serious means, but you also have to decide for yourself what likely means and where on the spectrum likely or likely not is. And when you look at the percentage of our MISPAs that come into medium, which is 75%, that means 75% of all missing people in Devon and Cornwall over a 12-year period, nearly 100,000 people, 75% of those we went, they likely-ish to come to some harm that might be serious. It's too big a category, and it affects when we talk about accuracy as well later on. Um, the, the finding that I'm probably most proud of, and the one that we, 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 Jeff and I kind of celebrated the most in our supervisions, was the predictive value of the risk factors is conditional on age and gender. And that's really important when we talk about the so what, because that affects risk assessment. That affects the questions that we ask and the way that we think about somebody's um, likelihood of, of coming to harm. Um, and then finally, that caveat on, on accuracy, as we've just described. But um, the current risk assessment process is less accurate than us just kind of assuming no misperv would come to harm. So um, we could, as a conversation with, with my chief, is if, if I went to him and said, I've designed a risk assessment process that 96% of the time will be accurate. Um, he said, yeah, that'd be brilliant. I'd bite your hand off for it. In return to the amount of misbehaviors that actually come to harm, um, you could do that by just saying, they'll be fine, and then hang up the phone. And 96% of the time, you're likely to be right. And that, for me, is why we do this, because it's around targeting, it's around having a greater understanding of risk assessment and being able to keep people safer. Um, so we'll just skip over the, I mean, don't spend too long on this slide. Um, it basically tells you which, which missing people come to harm. Um, that, those percentages are really small. That just uh, uh, it illustrates what, what we said earlier around the percentages. Um, but, but this was the bit that's quite exciting. So um, we're getting to odds ratios. Um, they are, they're not as good as random forests, and that's one of the, the discussion points of this is um, they're a good indicator, but actually if you really going to build up a, a prediction tool random forest is, is the way. Um, but our random odds ratios for all of the um, risk factors recorded in compact. So they're all listed on the left-hand side. Uh, and then the odds ratio is there. So uh, for those of you that have um, had uh, an input on odds ratios or understand them, uh, or haven't, sorry, um, over one means that it is a, there is a predictive value to it. It is a risk factor. If it's under one, it means it's a protective factor. Um, and that's what really jumped out on this. So if you look at the bottom two for in care and repeat, they are both um, some way under one. For our whole cohort of MISPAs, that means that if you are missing from care or you are a repeat MISPA, that is a protective factor. So you are less likely to come to harm if you're a repeat MISPA. You are less likely to come to harm if you're missing from care. And that didn't quite feel right to me. So some of the, we've all had experience with dealing with missing people. Um, and, and I thought that probably needed a little bit more of a looking at. And that is what prompted those two risk factors, where they appeared on that chart, is what prompted the, um, the disaggregation and that, that move into subgroups. And then this is what happened. For juvenile misfits, in care and repeat suddenly become a risk factor. When you take them away from all of the adult MISPAs in the study, it shows you that the 59% of the MISPAs that we've had in Devon and Cornwall since 2008, if they're missing from care or they're a repeat missing person and they're under 18, they are more likely to come to harm than their adult counterparts. 
The orange and the blue um, shows the difference between female and male. Um, and as we said earlier, female juvenile mispers are more likely to come to harm. So all of those odds ratios are, 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 are more, uh, more prevalent, more stark for, as a risk factor for, for females than they are for male juveniles. There are some of them that are kind of obvious as well. So suicidal won't surprise you that for every age category, um, for every gender, um, suicidal is a, is a risk factor. So if someone phones up to say this person's missing, they are suicidal, they've left a note, then they are going to be at risk. So, so there, there's, there's always a, a, you know, a couple of obvious ones in there. For adult mispers, so this is the 18 to 64 category. Again, um, females um, are, um, are more likely to come to harm, but, um, but there are some risk factors that really jump out um, in terms of being more prevalent for males, so suicidal um, very much so there. What was really interesting with this category was those two at the bottom, uh, the no repeat and the repeat. Um, and what that means is that, what, what that shows is that first time missing person, f if you're an, a male, is a risk factor, whereas if you're a female, it's, it's not. Whereas repeat misper, if you're female, is a risk factor, if you're male, you're not. So, so, so what that means in general reporting terms is if, if somebody reports an adult male between the 18, age of 18 and 64 missing for the first time, we should be more worried than we would be if they were a female being reported, and vice versa for women. Repeat missing people for missing women are more at risk than repeat missing males. And that, for me, kind of shows more, um, more validity beyond those subgroups and that more, defi more refined risk assessment. And then finally into the over 65s, where for the first time um, being male is uh, a higher indication of harm um, than being female. Um, one of the bits that was, that was difficult with this category was the small, the small size of it. So um, we had, as I said, 92,000 um, in the category. It was, uh, it was only about 3,500 of those MISPAs were over 65. Um, and then what that does is that skews um, your odds ratios because of some of the small subgroups. So um, if you look at suicidal, which we've already said is, it, we know is an indicator of, of risk and, and a predictor of harm, um, of the, uh, the th well, 3,900, uh, sorry, 3,200 um, in the study, only three of those were suicidal um, and and, and one of those did commit suicide. So, so actually, you end up with a, an odds ratio of 27.65. So what that tells you is that if you're over 65 and suicidal, you're 27 times more likely to come to harm. The reality is um, that that's not the case. That, that's a, where you get those small numbers, how it can skew something as like an odds ratio, and that's why random forest becomes um, something like random forest, more sophisticated, is, is, is more important. So, uh, so, the, so what? The, the, so the, the what next? Um, my, my assertion, my, the, the bit I'd really like to push forward and the bit that we're working on and, and, and discussing is um, a more refined risk assessment process for missing people, but that is specific to the age and the gender of the missing person. So APP supports subjective decision making from officers um, and um, that there is a place for that, absolutely, but I think that we can support that um, decision making with with data with with evidence to make to make that more more focused um, what that means in terms of when you're asking questions on the phone is the questions should probably be in a different order depending on the age and the gender of the MISPA first two questions gender age and then those questions depending on the risk factors dependent to their age predictive value based on their age and gender which means you could end up with essentially six different risk assessment models for MISPAs um, age and gender against each of the three age categories. The other bit I mentioned earlier around uh, medium risk, 75% of our missing people being medium risk. Um, there's, I think there's a conversation around those gradings. So, so high risk, great, we kind of know when someone's high risk, we put loads of resources to it. 
Um, that's, that's not a big number. That's kind of like 10% of, of the missing people we get. Um, and low risk as well, we, we kind of get that. But if we're putting 75% of our missing people in one category, um, then, then that doesn't lead to a targeted evidence-based policing approach. Um, and I don't know what it's like in your forces, but um, I, I imagine the, the resource that gets allocated to medium risk MISPAs can be dependent on time of the week, time of the day, part of the force you're in, um, what else is going on. Um, that's that's, that's a, a big, big category to have that, that kind of um, movement in terms of resource, that range of resource. So um, what we are looking at doing in Devon Cornwall is um, reassessing those risk ratings, seeing if we can make those more focused, and then rerunning those numbers that we've got, that 92,000, um, back through against newer risk ratings to see if we can increase the accuracy of those, um, alongside looking at that um, decision supporting matrix, how that might work going back across those numbers. Um, I'll put volunteers sort, because um, it would be really good to understand what that looks like in other forces. I've already had conversations with um, a couple of people who are on this course, um, and a couple of people in other forces who are interested in doing the same. Um, if you think this would add value to something you'd like to get involved in, then please let me know, um, and we'll look at how we can, can take that forward. Um, the, the more the merrier, basically, and, and the, more, um, the more accurate I think we'll, we'll end up um, putting something together. Um, and then that gives us the opportunity to, to start to inform change, so then we can start to have conversations with the college, with the MPCC, around um, making some, some change happen around this. Uh, and then the final point, as I said, odds ratios provide strong indicators, but um, those future models need to be built on something more sophisticated, um, such as the random forest that we heard earlier. Thank you very much. Like Ryan, my topic was around missing people, uh, but my focus was trying to understand how missing as a, a category within policing could perhaps be seen more as a, an opportunity rather than uh, a, a challenge for policing. As Ryan pointed out, there's a significant demand on policing from missing people uh, and it's extremely resource intensive and there's been a lot of research done uh, by vi previous uh, students of this course that demonstrate that uh, it's an area of focus and ever growing interest but I like to uh, think of it a bit more as a, an opportunity more like a signal crime and a signal incident rather than perhaps uh, something of demand and, and volume that we need to uh, gloss over. Uh, so what am I trying to present? Um, are missing episodes of young people that signal event, that opportunity to identify a chance to do more with them, and how could we do that? Um, uh, and just to give some context around this, in, in 2017, uh, the number of recorded missing incidents nationally was 286,171 reported episodes of missing, and 68% of those related to children, very similar to your findings in your study. Um, of that year in, in 2017, 9,066 were from my force area in Hampshire. Uh, and of uh, those, children, uh, those reports that uh, we submitted, 72% were young people. Um, so there was a, a real interest for me in my study to look at the impact of missing on young people, and particularly from my own operational experience, recent operational experience at the time when I started this course, of a cohort of young children that were subject to exploitation, county lines, uh, and a level of uh, you know, enforcement into crime and sexual activities. So my research question um, was, as on screen there, and I, I was particularly interested in what is the opportunity for harm prevention uh, and understanding the difference between, in harm with these, these kids. Uh, and for me, the important bit, actually, that kind of confused my uh, coach and mentor, Tim, completely for a while was the fact that I wanted to look at when they were not missing, not when they are missing. Um, I think what's evident uh, from the research to date, and, and again, from Ryan's comments earlier, that when young people are missing, very few percent actually come to any significant harm. And the most serious harm and the most tragic and awful outcome of them being found uh, dead, murdered, or, or, or of serious harm, it's about 0.5%, according to Vaux, who did some really in-depth studies around the volume of crimes and, and involvement in missing young children. And not that I want to discount that 0.5% of young children that are found in the most tragic circumstances, but 99.5% of those young people don't come to harm when missing. So my focus was actually, so, so what does that mean when they're not missing? If we know who these kids are, 
and we know that they're going missing on a regular basis. Can we try and work out what harm they are exposed to? And, and Lorraine touched on it earlier very well, uh, and so as, as of others today, around the adverse childhood experiences. What else is going on in their lives that causes missing to be that signal for us to uh, perhaps do a little bit more? Um, my thesis question broke down into six sub-questions, which is all around uh, the intricacies of the data, the gender, the ethnicity, the age, uh, and allowed me just to dig a little bit deeper into who these young children were. So this was my initial findings. Um, now, in, in Hampshire, I don't, I, I don't want to uh, preach the converted, but th there are a lot of uh, forces who are trying to identify the harm in missing through the number of times a young person goes missing. And our policy is they go missing three times in 90 days, they're at risk and possibly at harm. Uh, which for me, 90 days in a child's life is, is forever. Um, and uh, three times is, is way too late because one instance of being uh, exploited as a, as a young person is, is one too many. So actually, how does three and 90 equate? Um, what I did uh, identify that I, I took a cohort between 2016 and 2018. Uh, and uh, just in Portsmouth City. And the reason I took Portsmouth City, A, I worked there, but B, also our data was statistically very similar to the force and the national ratios of percentages of missing young people being recorded. Uh, what I did identify, as you can see on this chart on the far uh, side over there, there are just short of 900, 899 children were responsible for 4,368 missing episodes in a space of three years. Um, just to give some context on that, if you look at Green and Pakes and uh, add a little bit of inflation in there, that's about £5.6 million in resource time. What became apparent to me was um, these kids, there were clearly a power few. There is always a power few of young people at risk. Um, and when you look at the number of times they were going missing, the middle column here is the volume of times they were going missing. 6% of those kids. 51 children were responsible for 2,023 reported incidents, nearly half of the overall missing incidents that were coming in. So clearly there's a few kids that we could perhaps be doing better with. And this is where I started to find out something really quite different in that policy change. So uh, I, our force is working with the uh, Cambridge, not with the Cambridge Harm Index, but with um, the Office of National Statistics Crime Severity Score and looking at that as a, as a harm indicator for us. So using the scores within that, I then had to map their crimes, their reports over a period of time and try and identify uh, what their harm scores looked like in their involvement in crime when they were not missing. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment, which becomes a bit clearer on the next chart. But what was immediately identified from mapping their harm scores was that, again, about 6% were responsible for just 783 incidents, just. But what was particularly interesting was the, the little Venn diagram there in that of the top 6% of kids, 34 children were going repeatedly missing. 39 in the harm were going repeatedly missing. But in between, there's 17 that were overlapping and they were in both cohorts. They weren't all in both cohorts. You only had 17 kids that were both in volume and harm. So there's a gap in understanding that there were 39 kids in the harm cohort that weren't being picked up by the forced policy of 3 and 90 because they didn't tick the box. So those 39 kids are at high risk of high harm when they're not missing and we weren't worried about them. That concerned me. So I dug a bit deeper. Sorry, it's a bit busy, that one. Uh, I then had a look. This is how we started to work out the amount of harm they were involved in. Uh, and the amount of crime they're involved in. And this was particularly fascinating. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite get my head around this at the beginning, that these children, these 900 children, were responsible for 16% of the overall city crime in five years. Now, what I did was I took crime the year before the cohort went missing and the year after they went missing so that I could map their crime before missing and their crime after and see how that actually impacted on their missing episodes and whether it did or didn't. Um, for that five years of crime, those kids were responsible for 16% of overall city crime. Um, but again, and, th and this was the interesting twist again, in that the volume ones that were going missing most frequently were responsible for 3,322 crimes, uh, which was 3% of the overall city crime. Whereas the harm, how few, uh, those 50-odd children that were 
exposed to the most harm when not missing were responsible for 4% of 4,461 crimes. So the harm kids were experiencing a lot more harm when not missing and we weren't identifying these risks factors within them. And when you look at the crime categories, you come back to Lorraine's presentation earlier around robberies. Um, along here you've got uh, uh, robberies in here. And, and again, the harm are far more, you know, robbery of personal property, the harm category being the uh, red category, they're responsible for 89 of those crimes compared to the volume at 50. So they're, exp they're experiencing far higher crime. And again, when you look at rape, 126 children experienced rape in the harm category compared to 80 in the, vol in the volume. Um, that, that, that was really kind of stark and obvious to me that they are ex having some extremely uh, alternative experiences to a childhood that perhaps we'd like them to have. And those adverse childhood experiences are clearly playing on their behaviours. So then I dug down a bit deeper into um, understanding the cohort, and I broke them down into their age, the year, and their gender, um, and added in their harm scores. So the floating numbers above the, the tables are the harm scores uh, for that age range, uh, to give you an idea of what was the overall sort of harm. And what's been, uh, again, really apparent is our journey around crime data integrity and how we record crimes and people involved in, in crimes has obviously got clearer over the uh, years of our engagement uh, and using the systems because we are recording our data far clearer year on year. But what was stark with this one is this, this is the harm associated with males. Uh, and uh, within this study, I had to create a new category of perpetrator because what I wanted to understand was, were they a victim or offender? What was the victim-offender overlap? But actually, we don't record many people as offenders unless we prosecute, but they're quite often a suspect or a subject in the, in the crime themselves. Uh, and that means they were involved some, you know, quite likely they were quite likely that they were involved, we just can't prove a prosecution. Um, so we created the term perpetrator and bundled those together a bit in order to understand what's their exposure to that actual incident, were they there, what was, what was going on. And what was really clear from here, blues boys, reds girls, and when you talk about the harm associated with males, the boys are perpetrators. And when we went through the detail, the boys are nearly quite frequently the perpetrator of crime harm uh, when not missing. Uh, and they're involved in some quite significant violence, uh, which uh, was, was shocking. Uh, but what, what was also clear uh, within the boys uh, was around about the age 14, they're missing the most. Around the age 12, they're starting to go wrong. So at the age of t 12, we've got a real opportunity here we know they're going to start to get involved in crimes where they are perpetrators of harm. What are we doing about those 12-year-old boys to protect them and safeguard them and the community from their growing behaviour? What was interesting with the boys, though, was as they got to age 17, they were still involved in crime. Uh, and and that, that, although it reduced slightly, they were still involved in crime at age 17 as they left my cohort study. So I looked at the girls. Uh, What's stark here is the significant change in harm scores as we get clearer understanding of their involvement in crime. But the girls, similar age ranges. Um, again, age 14, 15, they're missing most frequently. Age 12 is when it starts to go wrong. Um, there's a pattern here. Um, but the girls are victims. Uh, and from my study, it was very clear to see the, the clear separation of those young people that are being recorded as missing within our data systems, when they are not missing, the boys are out committing offences, the girls are being involved as a victim of those offences. Uh, and that was quite stark. So you've got an opportunity here to really understand the ages and the genders and how we could perhaps do something different. Uh, but what was different here again with the girls, as you can see, by the time they got to 16, 17, their harm was reducing. The amount of crime they were involved with as a victim was reducing, unlike the boys who continued and that, when you went outside those age ranges and looked a bit further, that, that, that continued. So, uh, my findings. Um, the false policy of identifying risk in miss missing episodes around missing, for me, is flawed. I think one of my biggest learnings from the study that I did um, and the literature I reviewed is there's a massive difference between what is risk and what is harm. Police are fantastic risk managers 
and a lot of the evidence uh, from my research demonstrates, as, as some of Ryan's did, is that we're good at identifying risk. We understand risk. What we don't understand so well is harm. Um, and actually, if we understood harm, harm is long-term trauma. It takes time to come about. It is impacted and it stays with you. Risk is something with a level of skill, support and intervention you can largely mitigate or reduce. Harm continues. If you're a victim of a, a serious crime, it doesn't go away. You're still that victim. Uh, but if you're missing, we find you. The risk stops because we've made you somewhere safe. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a big understanding gap between what is risk and harm, especially in young people. Young females, strong tendency in being uh, a victim. Uh, and, and actually, when we ran the stats through, that was statistically significant. I can never say it. Um, uh, that actually supported that finding within the, the cohort I reviewed. Uh, and again, with the, with the males, it was statistically significant that they were perpetrators. Uh, as I've already said, uh, the risk of harm, largely the, 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 the sort of peak of experience for both those young people when not missing their exposure to crime in the community was age 14 when they were at most uh, involvement. Uh, but the age 10 to 12 demonstrated a real opportunity with some of those power few that were involved in high harm crimes that we might be able to do a level of intervention and support. And as I've already said, the subjective risk grading, I did a little bit of work around actually mapping the uh, harm scores to the risk gradings. And in general terms, those that were allocated as high risk were quite frequently high harm. Uh, those that were low risk were low harm. But again, the medium risk category, oh dear, there's an awful lot of very high harm people in the medium risk category that we're just missing uh, because we're classing them medium risk because it's a, a risk grading and not an understanding of harm. Um, of the uh, 900 children, uh, we really have an opportunity here to impact on crime demand. Uh, if, if missing is, is such a high demand issue on policing nationally, uh, and look at the crime they're involved with as well, if we could be, if we could recognise missing as a signal opportunity, a signal event, perhaps we could do some real efficiency savings here in, in making sure that we're resource effective in how we're doing this and realign those savings to actually safeguarding outreach and engagement. Uh, one of the anomalies that I didn't realise within this uh, study that I would find, uh, and it maps to the street robberies, again, Lorraine mentioned earlier in London, is that <laughs> weapons, 74% of uh, the males in the population were carrying weapons whenever they were stopped or dealt with or managed. Just a thought, 14, 12 to 14 year olds walking around with weapons, there's the evidence that demonstrates those missing young kids are carrying weapons. Girls not so much, but definitely the boys. In force, two of the biggest issues I found that we had, we were on an RMS niche basis. Uh, I'm interested, I might come and have a look at Compact with you, Ryan, um, and see the difference between the two. Because one of my biggest concerns is that we organisationally don't record in Hampshire who are looked after children. They're not flagged within police systems uh, that they are looked after children. And the problem being is, uh, as the data demonstrates from both yours and mine and other studies, a lot of these young people are in care um, and we're not sharing that information effectively nor in partnership to try and make sure that they understand the crime harm their, their children that they're responsible for guardianship of. They don't know what they're doing half the time and yet we do and we're not sharing that enough. Uh, one of the very stark, obvious points of my study, uh, we mentioned data quality earlier, Ours is atrocious. I wouldn't say it's bad. I'd say it's borderline atrocious. We do not record the ethnicity of those people that we're engaging with with any great detail in our systems. And when I tried to work out whether there was any level of correlation between ethnicity and missing, I just couldn't do it because I didn't actually record anything. If in doubt, we rec if they were white, we recorded them as white. If we didn't know, we'd put not known. Otherwise, we'd put not stated and just went with the flow just in case we had to tick a box. Uh, so culturally, there's a very big issue there within... Uh, our data quality that we need to make sure that officers are actually comfortable in ticking a box and asking those questions because actually if we understood the breakdown of our communities that we're actually engaging with through missing there are alternative ways of actually engaging with them as their own cultures their own backgrounds their own support networks that might make that intervention at that age range far more effective so i've raised these issues to the force uh, i haven't actually i've just actually 
put the thesis in. It's only gone in a month ago, and I've started raising this through my DEP and others, and we're starting to have discussions around this. But these are the areas that I think we could possibly do a little bit more work. Uh, there is definitely the opportunity to build an algorithm around crime harm scores and children, and on the data uh, uh, that's recorded on RMS uh, or any other uh, police system, have a facility where when a person calls up and says they are missing, we know roughly what their crime harm exposure is, and that might actually facilitate a better understanding of the risk grading we apply. Um, we can quite clearly look at opportunities with outreach and engagements around boys and girls and their age, and what we could do to actually make life safer for them. Uh, I absolutely think there is space for a randomised controlled trial in this study, uh, if somebody fancies taking it further forward and looking at this in more detail. Um, I fancy he's doing their PhD. Um, I think an RCT in, in understanding how we could engage those 12-year-olds sooner and recognise it as a signal crime would be really interesting. Um, there's a massive need to improve our force systems around that sharing information and guardianship and around improving our understanding of ethnicity. Thank you. This is, to me, a very appropriate subject on which to end a conference like this because it doesn't fit neatly into any of the boxes you've had so far, and yet I think you will all know from experience how much missing persons can be a straightforward operational problem. You've heard the straight numbers of figures, 15% or whatever it might be. I remember back to my days as a duty officer and inspector in the Metropolitan Police, I led a charmed life because every time it got really sticky with a missing person, suddenly they magically turned up. I didn't deserve that success. I didn't work for it in the way these guys are working for that kind of success. But I do remember the pain and feeling that when something's gone wrong, you don't know where the child is. It doesn't always end happily, like one case I remember, where you take the girl back to her daughter and say, you, back to her mother and say, you really need to have a serious conversation with your daughter about whether she is allowed to have a boyfriend at the age of 14. Because mother said, no, 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 she doesn't have a boyfriend. Can't happen, can't happen, absolutely impossible. Mothers don't always know best. Fathers, like me, don't always know best, but there you go. The curious thing about missing persons is the number of television programs that are now predicated around a missing child, all the Scandi Noir stuff and all the rest of it, they like to start with a bit of schlock horror, so they have a missing child somewhere early in the plot. Likewise, it can be disastrous. There was a chief constable not far from here who remembers a detective superintendent coming to him and saying, we've got a missing person and I'm not very happy about it. Never mind the grading, never mind the indicators, something smelled. That was Millie Dowler, for those of you who remember the case. Who's this year's most famous missing person in Britain? Sarah Everard. And think of the implications that flow from that. A simple statement, someone is missing, but all the implications that can flow from it. Missing people is a whole hell of a subject, and it's mixed up with all sorts of other people. It's mixed up with risks, you've heard that. It's mixed up with some of the earlier stuff that I think you've heard about adverse childhood experiences because some of those adverse childhood experiences come in, as Mark has particularly said, when a young female is missing. It's mixed up with drugs and county lines. You've heard suggestions of that. It's mixed up with the victim-offender overlap, and you've heard some research on that, and there's more research out there and available. It's mixed up with a subject you haven't heard about in the first year yet, life course deviancy. When do young people start to go wrong? How many people carry on going wrong for a long time? It's tied in with a whole lot of stuff, and I don't think the police service, until now, giving due deference, has taken it as seriously as we might take it because it affects the course of so many people's lives in so many ways and we need to develop some more understanding. Enough from me. Questions from you for our speakers. Thank you for that really interesting talk. A missing people is something that I'm incredibly interested about. Um, it kind of resonates with me, really, that there are so many missing children that actually take up so much of police's time, uh, and then we move on to handing them to a multi-agency service where they get passed from pillar to post in terms of those people in the system that we trust in care homes to look after them, actually as soon as they walk out the door again, uh, they're calling us to come and look for them again. So really, that, the statement that I've just made, the question is, how do we then look at uh, protecting those children longer term, and is that something that you've thought about looking at in terms of that multi-agency approach, corralling the health and local authority services? Okay, uh, thank you. No, it's something that I particularly wanted to dig into because part of this work that I started on was working with the City Council, the MET team, uh, the Missing Exploited team, and uh, the Looked After Children team because of the, ki the kids that I was managing in a, in a 
a, a young gang group uh, where county lines exploited and I think something like 75% of the kids I was dealing with in that group were looked after children. So I was fascinated to understand how we can actually get a better service for those kids. Um, guardianship is absolutely key and when you do the research around missing and start to dig into the literary reviews of the, that are out there, guardianship is absolutely one of the strongest elements of opportunity to safeguard these kids. And I think um, out of this, as I said at the end of my presentation, sharing that information early about the crime they're involved with when they're not missing is the key opportunity I don't think we take organisationally. I don't think we actually give a complete download of our uh, data and information to partners that demonstrates the amount of crime we know they are involved in. We talk about the missing case, we talk about the time they've gone missing, and we talk about the circumstances of that missing, but we don't necessarily always provide the context and the why. And I think there's a real opportunity around that age of 12 to start talking about why and sharing that with partners. There was, we talked about yesterday about things that we've learned from this course. Um, there was a big one for me around not talking to journalists about your studies when Larry kindly publishes them. Um, just for Christmas, The Telegraph ran a, a short news story on, uh, on mine, and the headline was, Police Should Focus on Missing Adults, Not Missing Children, um, which you can imagine the phone calls I was getting afterwards <laughs> from people telling me what was I talking about. Um, and the reason, was, the, the reason I raised that is it's really important, it links to your point, but it shows when you put mine and Marcus's work together and some of the work we heard today around adverse child incidents and um, exploitation of county lines, 6.5% of the adults in my study came to harm, and less than 2% of children came to harm when missing. Um, and that links into that operational, we find a child, we, we, we give them back, because the harm doesn't happen when they're missing. So purely from a missing point of view, that's why we need to be more targeted around what we do. Harm, which is the really important bit, and that's when you take all of that together, those young people are coming to harm all the time. So we need to have a far more sophisticated approach as a service to preventing young people from coming to harm rather than just branding them as a missing young person they're streetwise they'll come back they won't get harmed we really need to dig into that much deeper as a service with uh, the comments from the very beginning of the day resonating about rapid video response let's revisit a question that came up but i think it's um, it came up this morning with people in this audience, but it's, it's a really um, uh, interesting question that you'll probably hear again and again. So um, Kent and Stacy, the question was, what about the chance to check other things that you can't get from the conversation? The general observation, the Mike Barton theory that you never go to a domestic without asking to see the children and then inspecting the room, the state of cleanliness, food, open the refrigerator to see what food is there, all of that sort of thing, which I must say, I'd like to see somebody do a prevalence of how often that actually happens in these cases. So, you know, are we missing 100% of the cases where they would do that or, or, or 5%? Um, but uh, you had a good response to it this morning in terms of how much you could see. And the other thing I was impressed by was the idea that it probably looked a lot worse right away on the screen than it, it would have looked two hours later uh, if they could have cleaned it up. But do, do you have further responses or thoughts about this in relation to how, if anybody wanted to replicate this, if they were worried about the safety checks in, a, in effect, what, what would you build into this, if anything, from the standpoint of the, the RBR? Um, so I had a thought about that after. The the question, and um, essentially that is, how do we measure that in the cases in business as usual? So um, it's a very good question about protecting the most vulnerable and, and the children in, um, that are at risk. Um, we have done a very small piece of work where we've got one of our experts in domestic abuse to look at the quality of interaction and voice of the child with regards to a small number of cases in the treatment and in the control cases by examining body-worn video. Um, and I think it's something where, the, and this is when we, I refer to the traditional culture that we're challenging, that a, that a physical attendance is, is necessarily better. But I think moving forward, if further research could be done with a, um, somehow capturing the quality of police interaction 
and, um, and voice of the child so that we can make sure that whether we are attending in person or virtually, that we are doing the best we can um, and more importantly, that we're protecting those most in need. I don't know whether, Kent, you have anything? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, we, it's an area that could be researched um, and, and followed through. Um. And on another area, <clears throat> Kent, could you just comment on the potential for a one or two year follow up on repeat offending harm levels of the victims, whether there's any difference between the two measures? Yes, yes. I mean, we hope to be able to answer that question in one or two years. Um, could you restate it? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, the question um, Professor Sherman was asking was about follow-up periods in the next couple of years with respect to harm, uh, repeat offending, victimisation. Uh, and within the Kent Police study, um, we will hopefully be able to answer that question in a couple of years. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, ben Clark, we have Ben? No, Miss Ben? Okay. Helen Wander yesterday was asking if uh, uh, speakers were classing theft from motor vehicle as high harm within neighborhoods, which I think she was suggesting uh, it is. And um, I, I don't know uh, whether harm a as much as compassion is really what the implication is of uh, Ben's uh, findings. I don't know if anybody wanted to uh, comment on the implications of making the investment in calling people back but especially from the standpoint of the findings about the demographics. Um, Phil, you, you spent a lot of time calling victims, not on this particular uh, issue, but in the Met, what, what do you think would be this sort of um, reaction to the idea of targeting demographically responsive groups with this kind of callback if they're young, if they're minority, uh, if they're a specific gender? Is the movement towards customized or bespoke policing, policing now strong enough to uh, sort of um, compete against the idea of consistent policing for everybody in the great egalitarian um, uh, vision of, of Britain? Or how, how is that actually playing out on the ground in the Met? Uh, so I think it's important to, make, to keep things as simple as possible because the more moving parts, the greater the opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, within Turning Point, we, we have the demographics, and I didn't share those because at the moment the, the sample size is too small, but it'll be interesting to look, to look at those later on uh, and to ask some of those questions. You know, do, do, we, do we tailor our response to certain um, demographic groups? And I, I think there could, could be an argument for that, but maybe... See, with Ben, he's got such a range. He's got theft of pedal cycle, you know, which a very, very low harm offence and, and yet um, and I'm also looking at low harm offences. Um, we, we know that certain offences attract um, you know, family liaison officers, so officers much more, you know, that victim engagement right from the get-go. Um, is this a middle ground? I, I think there probably is, um, but we'd need to design it so it, it, it didn't, it didn't, we didn't set ourselves up to fail. Um, my findings so far of, of the surveys that we've done focused on Barnet. Obviously, Brent um, is a very different borough. Um, Harrow, uh, again, quite different to Brent. So I, I think it's a really interesting space and something perhaps for, for, for exploration from maybe some of the, some of the year oneers. you know. I think this, this is really interesting. <laughs> Not to pass the buck, but, you know. No, that's all right, because I think one of the great things about the past two days has been the, the kind of uh, relentless inspiration to uh, first-year students who are thinking about what their thesis topics would be. And there's a lot of level four apprentices who are going to be watching uh, these videos who will be thinking about a project that they can undertake as part of their apprenticeship uh, year in collaboration with their colleagues in frontline applications of, of evidence-based uh, policing as we're just uh, beginning to, to roll it out with uh, a variety of forces around uh, the UK, completely on the apprenticeship levy, I would say, with no extra cost. But let me go to this question of victimless prosecution in domestic abuse cases. Owain Richards, uh, who um, did a thesis on the positive outcome predictors using an odds ratio analysis very similar to what Ryan Doyle did with the um, uh, missed persons uh, harm outcomes. Uh, Owain uh, found that uh, victim, um, uh, shall we say, 
uh, declination of the opportunity to cooperate with posit positive outcomes was a very strong predictor of not making uh, an arrest. It was probably uh, highly correlated with another strong predictor, which is that the offender was absent, which is, of course, the condition for getting in the RVR experiment. But lots of domestic violence people here uh, at, the, uh, at the podium. Anybody want to uh, comment on uh, what we've heard today about research that would perhaps be important uh, for this ongoing debate about the proper police duty or the proper police policy in relation to um, co cooperation or non-cooperation from victims in domestic abuse cases, um, a absent very high levels of harm, for example, uh, perhaps more in the, in the high volume range of non-cooperation. Does anybody uh, want to take away several of the studies or even one of them uh, for uh, following up on a comment? Maybe I should ask Will Lay, who's of course dealing with the people who are the highest harm, but uh, whether you, you, you drew anything from some of the findings you, you heard today, Will. Yeah, thank you. So um, in my research, I didn't focus uh, specifically on DA, but obviously there were some of the highest harm victims are those that only suffer DA. Um, so I think there's probably that ongoing assessment around um, public interest and the interest in the victim. If someone is suffering high harm, then actually the duty falls upon us probably to intervene, especially where, um, as the, question, the first question came up around other people that may be present, if there's children, et cetera, uh, then that's obviously going to influence our, our response. And I know um, someone who's not here, but someone whose thesis this year, Matt Basford, looked a lot at looking at some of the other factors and the, and the variables that could lead to um, evidence-based prosecutions. And, and one of the highest ranked will be no surprise to people, but it's uh, having an independent witness statement, so having that sort of independence. So there's always that point of bringing in other people where it's witnessed by, albeit rarely, directly, but where there are witnesses, that the wider perception, the wider public interest. Um, so I think it is important that there's always going to be that balance of the victim's wishes, but it is far, it's certainly not the, the main uh, factor in making those decisions. Yeah, so just, um, just leading on from that, HMIC have recently looked at how well the police responded to domestic abuse during COVID, um, which was really positive. But one of the things that they flagged up is the really low positive outcome rate um, for domestic abuse cases. And I think it's quite fair to say that across police forces, we have the outcome 16 problem, which is where victims refuse to engage and support a prosecution. So at that point, we've got a bit of a dilemma. Do we follow the wishes of the victim or do we actually say actually this is a real public interest issue that we need to progress and therein lies actually um, our ability to influence CPS so there's two gateways that we can use to increase um, positive outcomes uh, as evidence-led prosecutions so one of them is that the victim can demonstrate that they're in fear of the offender and the second one is that it's in the interest of justice so you've got to do one of those two gateways to actually get your um, case home at court, which is very difficult. So I think there's definitely some challenges there, um, and it'd be interesting to see if you know anybody who has got some um, evidence really about how we can increase victim engagement, especially in domestic abuse. Well, just just to uh, respond to Alice, I, I think there's uh, an empirical question uh, about. Uh, whether it's in the interest of the victim, uh, that can be, can be answered by evidence-based policing. I, I think the question of uh, doing justice is, shall we say, uh, inclusive of empirical findings, but that's not the only game. Uh, and what is morally good and right is a matter as much for theologians um, and certainly politicians as it is for criminologists. But with respect to whether it is a good thing for the victim, we certainly heard evidence today from Andy Jenkins that it's um, a slight elevation, but nonetheless elevation in recidivism um, against the victim. Um, in in um, the larger scheme of things, the challenge in Britain remains the uh, third rail of random assignment of anything having to do with domestic abuse, which means that we get a finding like the uh, higher level of repeat offending when an IDVA is involved and we can't separate the possibility of the IDVAs got involved in the cases that were more likely in the first place to have repeat offending. And so we can't separate that correlation of the application of the service to the higher risk cases 
from the non-application of the service to the lower risk cases, which meant that even before the service was applied, the ones that didn't get it were less likely to have repeat offending. There, there is a way around this, and especially where you have limited resources, if you can only do Monday and Tuesday, um, why not randomly assign the days? Well, we had this conversation uh, with Ben, and, and it was, uh, sorry, not with, uh, with, with Ben, but um, with John. What happens is apparently the, um, there is some issue about how you could possibly have in a, uh, what's called a trickle flow experiment, um, have the, uh, the fairness of a level playing field in which each case has an equal chance of getting uh, this asset. And if the intention is not to give it out equally, but to give it out bespoke, give it to those who need it most, then you're stuck, because you really can't then take the correlation apart and estimate what the effect is of, of the treatment. Um, so uh, these, uh, these second year students who we're talking to at the moment uh, might have more progress to make on that front. In the meantime, uh, it is um, worthy of note that in 2009, there was an experiment all ready to go in which victims who didn't want to support prosecution, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was offender absent victims were given the choice as to whether to recommend or advise for or against um, pursuing the victim, uh, pursuing the offender uh, if the offender was already gone. And it was about ready to go when the IPCC came down on Greater Manchester for being responsible for a murder because some years before an arrest had not been made. And there's absolutely no evidence that arrest is a preventative of murder. And we know that from uh, the one long-term randomized trial over 23 years follow-up that looked at um, 1,113 cases. But it just seemed so obvious to the IPCC that they not only excoriated GMP, they excoriated Essex and uh, some other forces about that time on an evidence-free uh, criticism that positive action is, is the best thing uh, for protecting victims. When, from an evidence standpoint, we just can't support that uh, with scientific data. So I don't know where it's going to lead, but I know that having this discussion this year is a surprise to me because five years ago we came that close to it with one of the forces represented on this stage. I won't say which. And, and it got said no at NPCC. We couldn't do that. Um, we couldn't leave um, people to do voluntary attendance as an alternative to being arrested and transported. Um, and yet, it's a widespread technique. It's just something about random assignment that is a challenge. Does anybody have a solution to that? Anybody here have a good idea for how we can actually sell random assignment more effectively to the uh, chief officer teams or the PCCs or the uh, others in decision-making roles uh, in this country. Um, and nobody here wants to risk their jobs, uh, perhaps. But go ahead, Jeff, risk your job. Um, we, well. yeah. we just got done with a year and a half in which the only reason a lot of us are here today is because a group of people, tens of thousands of people volunteered to get saline injected into their arms instead of an active vaccine. And that's how we proved the vaccines were safe and effective. Um, some of those people got sick in the control group. Um, some of them ended up very seriously ill and I believe some of them died. But their sacrifice is what allowed us to move forward as a society and actually start to move past this pandemic. So there's never been a historical moment where it's easier to explain why we need a control group. Thanks for that. Um, a very powerful argument. I don't know if anybody's tried it yet, but think about it. <laughs> uh, now, questions here from the audience. I promise to give you all a, a chance for a second go at anybody here who uh, started out. I just wondered, um, just to pick up on the point about the outcome 16 and the drop-off rates um, for victims, although it's not a scientific, certainly work I've done in Greater Manchester, where we've looked at the drop-off rate of victims, it struck me that often it was signed off as a Section 16, but there's been a lot of delays in our investigation, um, and actually there was an element of the victims were being told that, but they were, um, involved at the earliest stages and the longer it took to get through the criminal justice system 
may be led to some of those decisions. And I wondered whether anything had ever been done to actually see at the point that we lose most of our victims. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I can answer the question now, but I know within our RVR, the rapid video response, we are actively seeking to answer that question. Um, so maybe in a year or so, if we come back, um, we, we are hoping to, to see what's happened with our um, victims who were seen immediately on video to see if, you know, just that, that little change between the few days at the beginning um, for domestic abuse. So, I mean, it's, I, I think it's an area that would be um, ripe for some research, but we're hopefully going to look at it on a small scale. I'll add a little bit, if I may, because we have to bear in mind that whatever procedures we go through, the paperwork then has to go through the criminal justice system, which is flawed in its own way. Yeah. I did attend a penology lecture in the course of the last fortnight, which a classic lawyer, and I say classic because he took a very straight line on all these things, was lamenting the things that are happening in the courts these days. And, for example, he said, someone going to court now for an indictable, or what's the, not indictable, it's a recordable offence now. We're looking at court dates in late 23. What's that going to do to your victim? Anybody here can do the best they like, and then they're told your first chance to give evidence against this man will be in late 2023. That's a sobering thought. Alice, uh, I think, wants to uh, supplement that. Crispian, thank you. Yeah, I think your point around at what point do victims disengage is really interesting. And I think it's definitely something that we need to look at, not just in terms of domestic abuse, but also in rape and serious sexual offences as well. And um, there's a superintendent called Katie Grint, I think her name is, from Thames Valley. Somebody might want to, yes, I'm on the right track. Um, she's just done some research um, involving a Crown Court where she has fast-tracked victims um, to court where they've still literally had bruises um, and physical signs of abuse on them. And, and that has increased the victim engagement. Um, however, how replicable that is in other areas, especially given the COVID challenges that uh, Chris has just alluded to, is um, it's questionable. Thank you. I have one for the panel. It's, it's quite a general one. It's around mental health. And I know that um, probably, well, definitely all the forces um, have seen with the sort of ongoing more emphasis on care in the community and less uh, places being available for people with quite severe mental health difficulties, um, especially referencing paranoid schizophrenia and things of that nature. Um, I began to notice a correlation with um, that and murders when I was on the MIT teams and I'm just wondering if any of the uh, panel on the stage have done any or know of any studies into that and also the effect of that on missing people as well because obviously it's young people and um, the over 65s which potentially could have um, you know implications with Alzheimer's and vascular dementia but um, have you noticed with the uh, missing people as well, um, with more people in the community um, and often being left, particularly in COVID, um, unsupervised and people not ensuring that they're taking their medication? Marcus Cater, I think you're well suited to uh, look at that from, especially from the juvenile standpoint, but uh, we could start with Ryan, who so got the microphone first. Yeah, so um, I can take it from a, not, not from a missing person point of view, but from head of criminal justice and custody um, right. point of view. So, so we've had um, a real recognizable increase in mental health um, sufferers in, cust in our custody centers in Devon and Cornwall, um, certainly over the last 12 months. Um, what we're also seeing is um, far more pressure on on our part, NHS partners in terms of being able to deal with that. So availability of beds, availability of treatment, etc. So um, so we, we we've just had an HMYC inspection actually um, in terms of our links between mental health and, and custody. We, we've got really strong links with liaison and diversion. Um, some some really good schemes that we're sort of running for and trying to help people whilst they're with us. Um, but that's just whilst they're with us. And then that moment where we hand them over to NHS, um, and, and we have, you know, we have some problems. We had quite a high-profile double murder in the force a couple of years ago, um, which was involving a, um, a, a chat with mental health problems. Uh, it, it, it is, it is an issue. It is absolutely something that needs to be pushed forward. It's one of those wicked problems, though, that isn't just on the police service, um, and and that's where it becomes trouble. And that's where it comes from. And a lot of the research 
we all do as well, is you, you, find, you find a wicked problem, uh, the solution isn't just with policing, um, and, and that's where it becomes a, a, a real problem. Thank you, Ryan. Marcus. Although my study was on young people, mental health was definitely one of the elements that was uh, recognisable within my cohort. But before I refined my research down, I read a lot of the studies by previous theses here, um, and uh, they can quite clearly evidence that mental health and missing are, are, are linked within the older age range, and especially in the high risk category, uh, which then ends up with your uh, people that are most likely to have a level of fatality. Uh, so, yeah, there are links, and, and Vaux, uh, Tolbert, uh, several of them. I've got, I've got a whole list that I can give you if you want them afterwards. Uh, there's about six or seven theses prior to uh, Ryan's uh, that actually do uh, focus on sort of the overall uh, category of missing, and mental health is a theme that comes up, but also in my literature review, going back to some of the work in American paediatrics and uh, in Australia as well, mental health was a category that came up quite regularly with missing, so there's lots of information out there around that category I'm missing. Marcus, while I have you, can I uh, ask you to clarify for everybody uh, this incredible finding of 16% of all criminal incidents associated with the uh, category of missing children when they weren't missing, and because this is very close to what Ashley Liggins uh, has published as her power few offenders thesis over uh, 10 years or eight years in Northamptonshire. Um, could I just clarify that you're talking about the percentage of all the incidents for which uh, a person was named, uh, either the, because it was detected or, or a subject was identified, so that we, we it, it, she called it offender identified crime, or is it actually 100% of the incidents, in which case the percentage of offender identified would be even higher than the 16%. It was all crime, uh, so it was all crime and all categories, uh, and when you actually looked at the number of crimes recorded, their involvement as either a victim, a witness, and or an offender, subject or suspect in the perpetrator category. So it was in all those categories, when you actually looked at uh, their involvement, they were involved in that much crime, uh, and quite a lot of that was uh, as, as played out with the the girls in the cohort was as a victim mm. um, because they were involved in domestic abuse. Quite a lot of these young people are recorded as a victim or a witness within domestic abuse that's been recorded. So you, it, it, it's not um, just their perpetrator flag. It's actually, when you look at oh, the amount of domestic abuse that's happening in the city, a lot of these kids are witnesses or victims to that domestic abuse environment. Uh, so it was all crime. Uh, and, and when, again, their connection to it could have been as other than perpetrator. Yes, absolutely. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you very much. That's um, a, a really um, stirring reminder of a basic finding from the Cambridge Delinquency Study from the 1960s, which is early onset is one of the best predictors of both um, volume of criminal activity and severity. Mm -hmm. And it's also one of the most longest lasting because the Philadelphia study found that even at age 50, what year you had your first serious offense increased your likelihood of being arrested for murder uh, or charged with murder again. So it, it, it is, I think it was Crispian who said the basic findings from life course criminology are highly relevant here. And it, it is remarkable that without particular framing, we just keep hitting on those things again and again in ways that challenge us to say, well, shouldn't we do more when we know that this person is in that category. And that was one of my key concerns between the difference in policing between risk and harm and the fact that we don't necessarily have a clear um, understanding of the impact of the harm and, and the trauma that, that, that then has on the long, lifelong journey of those kids. Thank you, Marcus. Heather Strang uh, of the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge has a question. Thanks. Um, I don't know if Lorraine Hilda is in the room. Um, just, to, just to mention that uh, Lorraine presented this morning on a cohort of 81 um, extremely prolific young uh, robbers in London and she found that uh, of those people, some of whom had committed as many as 16 robberies in the preceding year, 49% uh, of them uh, had been missing at some point in their lives, which won't come as a surprise to Marcus. But I think it's, a, you know, it's really important to look at 
this problem the way you have, Marcus, because in the past I think there's been a sense that, um, you know, with young people mostly, yes, they go missing a lot, but nothing much happens to them. But it's the, the, fact, it's the fact of the signal of their going missing that we need to appreciate. And I think Lorraine's work very much reinforces yours in, uh, in using it as a signal, as an identifier of real problems well beyond uh, any harm they may have experienced in any one missing uh, uh, incident. I suppose it's always useful to uh, the first year students in the room uh, to reflect on um, what can be learned from the experience of people, most of whom on this stage have gone through a, a thesis uh, project. And uh, I think maybe the best way to end is to hand the mic down uh, from, from Phil to Marcus. Uh, and uh, ask if you had one thing to tell the people in this room who are going to undertake um, a research project that will become a major part of their lives. What, what piece of advice, if any, would you give them? So, uh, Phil, if you want to think about it longer uh, or if you want to start us off, sure. uh, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. thank you. So, um, well, I've learned an awful lot, to be, to be fair, and um, I've had some, some great sort of uh, mentorship as well from the likes of Katie. Um, but um, I guess this course, coming on this course, you, you, you do get a, all of a sudden a, a really broad view on life uh, across UK policing and for our cohort, quite a few from abroad as well. And um, so, so I think the learning is that there's a huge appetite to do something different, to do to, do, to take that evidence-based based approach rather than just keep doing the same old, same old. Um, and so you, the appetite is there. Uh, you need the confidence um, to, to, just to jump in and get stuck in. Um, but pick something, I think, that's going to make a difference ultimately. That's, that's you know, do, because then not only you, that your passion will be, you will convert, you know, your effort into, into something tangible. Um, so, so that would be um, that would be my uh, advice. Um, pick something practical uh, and get stuck in. So. Thanks. Um, for me, it'd be about um, narrowing down what you're actually looking at. Um, for me, I had about 15 sub questions, <laughs> and I found myself kind of spreading myself a bit too thin. And every time I found something, um, Alicia was getting excited about data. You do, you naturally get drawn in and you want to look at something else and something else and something else and it just keeps going and going and going um, and it could easily turn into a kind of two, three year project. Um, so if I'd have narrowed down and stuck to it rather than kind of just keep going and going, I presented probably about a third of my findings um, just because there was so much going on. So um, narrow it down, focus and, and stick to it. I have to admit that uh, I am often the source of that long list of questions. I, w I wasn't going to say anything. But <laughs> what, what I want to make clear to everybody here who has been through that and who will be going through it, uh, the point of it is to leave you lots of options in case plan A falls through, plan B falls through, plan C falls through. And the one piece of insurance I can give you is lots of questions, one of which you can actually answer. Uh, and if you get more than that, you're doing well. So thank you for make, bring, you're making us uh, pay attention to that long list of questions. And Alice, I think you may have had a similar experience. Yeah, no, just to echo that really, I think the ideal situation is that you have a funnel and you get to the end part rather than a mushroom, which mine ended up. Um, but probably the, the one thing that I learned most from this is that if you're going to do a piece of research that impacts on other agencies, I would get in with those agencies early before you even start collecting your data um, because if you get their buy-in and bring them along with you on your journey, once you're delivering your results, actually if, they've got the, if it's got the potential um, to be problematic, you're more likely to have them on side. It'll be an easier journey for you and uh, I wish I'd done that at the beginning of mine. Um, yeah, so mine probably builds on the focus point, really. I had very similar issues. Um, so mine's probably more a word of warning around big data sets. Um, rather than focus on a certain crime type, I thought I'd just look at all victimizations and across six years, which led to 
a lot of records um, and every time we try to do analysis it pretty much collapsed the computer and it wouldn't work and you had to try and do stuff overnight and it just wasn't functioning so big data is good it gives you a lot of insight the sample size is really useful but I suppose the caveat with that is it comes with a lot of headaches especially when you've got um, IT challenges so the focus points are a really important one choosing if you're looking at crime then looking at specific areas of crime or a specific topic that's relevant to your department or your work or just something you're interested in I probably in hindsight would now have done that and focused on one area rather than all crime. So Will is your message big data on small questions or shall we say focused uh, well-defined precise questions? Yeah absolutely get, get the precision and, and the focus and you'll probably then be able to use the data you need rather than just get everything and then worry about trying to cut it down later that's the issues I had. Great thank you. Thank you. Um, so not everyone gets the opportunity to come here and not everybody is, um, has the ability to, to do this course. So um, I'll be honest, my, my advice would be embrace it. Um, find yourself a network and build yourself a network over the next couple of years. It'll help you get through your studies. Um, and if you do something you care about as well, those two things, that network and doing a study you care about means that you'll get a lot more out of these two years and it will keep giving um, post as well. So we finished 18 months two years ago. Um, and it's still it's still rolling on sort of the, the outcomes of it. So um, yeah, so build yourself a network, um, embrace it. Do I get to say anything? Uh, you, do you hold a master of studies degree? I, I, well, go ahead, hold Dr. It. Barnes. <laughs> I, I, I will say that in policing, we are not we are not very often encouraged to admit weakness. This very we don't come after a prosecution and say. Okay, we got through it and we got a conviction, but boy, parts of that were really bad. Um, we don't admit that. Um, yet there is a section in your thesis where you have to discuss limitations, and it typically comes about 90% of the way through the thesis, just at the moment that you're running out of your 18,000 words. That actually is a really important part of your thesis. Admitting the limitations of your study, it gives guidance for the next people who come after you and want to do studies. If there's one thing I marked down on thesis, it's that you gave me a page and a half of limitations and none of them were actually limitations. You, you just admitted like, well, I only looked at my force. I don't know whether the other forces are like this. That's not a limitation. That's just reality. Um, so leave some space and actually admit your limitations. Stacy, you had no limitations. Go ahead. <laughs> um, probably something a bit different. Um, and I'd um, implore you to read uh, Dr. Strang's uh, I think it's called Coalitions for a Common Purpose article. Um, the biggest thing that I learned was that, and I'm sure each and every one of you will have this, you're not going to do this on your own. You're going to be reliant upon the teams that you work with in your forces. And I was privileged to work with some really dedicated, smart individuals, my dispatchers, my RVR and RTREC officers, Kent to my right, and um, the ITF, and a uh, chap at the back. And I think if you invest in those people and win hearts and minds, they'll help you through it and support you, so that would be my advice. Now we promoted Kent upstairs to a PhD before he could finish his MST, so that's why you're handing off to Marcus Kent. Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> Thanks for that. I, I think, I echo everything everybody said, but I think possibly one of the most challenging parts for me was thinking that 18,000 words was going to be a mountain to climb. It was a mountain to come down from. I had to work back from 28 down to 18 to get it in. I wow. um, don't think 18,000 words is going to be um, a, a challenge. The challenge is actually once you start taking on this journey and doing this research, fitting it into 18,000 words is a nasty process. Oh, I did not enjoy that bit. Oh, I wish it could have been 28, but there we go. Well, thanks to you all for that. And, and let me say to those of you who may be online, uh, but who have also finished an MST thesis, that um, the uh, COVID and other complications of pulling off this conference this year make it uh, a miraculous thing that it happened at all.